Our God is still on his throne and ruling the affairs of man. Even as he does not change, his truths have not changed. Thankfully, God still has a people which proclaim that old-time religion, setting forth his sovereignty, and the old paths of truth where we can find rest for our souls. Welcome to Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Get your Bible, call your friends, and sit back as we open the King James Scriptures to explore the glorious Word of Sovereign Grace. Here's this week's message. This morning I tried to speak to you on law and grace and its relationship to us and the truth of it as I understood it in God's Word. I want to continue that subject this evening and I, I hope that I'm able to distinguish uh, for you uh, law and grace and place them in their proper perspective for each believer. By the way, the Old Testament speaks of the Old Covenant and the law, giving up the law as glorious, but uh, the doctrine of grace and the coming in of the New Covenant and the fulfillment of prophecy and the coming of Jesus Christ and of that dispensation being exceeding uh, greater in glory than the first covenant. Though both were glorious. I will begin with Galatians 3 and 13 and I hope that we can get the spiritual import and the blessedness of this thought Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hanged on the tree. Now, I tried to teach you this morning and show you that the curse or the fault was not in the law itself, but it was, was sin. And because we were cursed by the law, it, demand, it, it demanded a perfect obedience, and that was not found in us. And as a result, uh, it, it brought the curse of condemnation upon us. But Jesus, fulfilling that law and, and taking our place in death and in suffering and in, uh, endured the indignation and wrath of God against sin, he was made a curse for us, and we, deli we were delivered from the curse of the law. Though uh, we had broken, uh, as we had broken the law, as we were found sinners, it required a perfect obedience in him. And I, uh, uh, my subject matter, I wanted to bring that text to you in connection with what I uh, had spoken this morning, but I hope to center my thoughts mainly around Matthew 5 and 17. Matthew 5 and 17. And 18 and uh, especially uh, verse 17. And possibly if the Lord lead me, I will look at uh, the 19th verse as well. I... I really wish that, that if the Lord would bless me, that there were more people here uh, to, uh, for us to think about these things because I feel that they are they're so important and it is so necessary that we understand them. We have been falsely accused of uh, many individuals on what we believe. Brother Neely, we've, it, it has been said of us that, uh, that we do evil that good may come and it doesn't matter uh, how we live or how we conduct ourselves that we're going to heaven anyway that that's what we believe but uh, and and really uh, you would be surprised at the people that charge us with those things but that is not what we as a church believe that is not mainly what primitive Baptists in general believe that's not what the Bible teaches and and 
I, I certainly want to settle that with you as to what I believe and what I think God's Word teaches. <clears throat> I, I think that uh, after having said that, I ought to begin with the 16th verse of uh, Matthew uh, 5. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And uh, how, how is that possibly going to be if we set aside the law in respect of a rule of action? Now, it is, it is said of us that we are antinomian or that we are superlapsarian, uh, whatever those terms might mean to you, uh, and, and people, uh, uh, people ha even uh, theologians have a different meaning of those terms, but what, uh, what antinomian uh, means in theology is that the believer has no use for the moral law, that after he becomes a believer and he realizes that Christ is his Savior, that he has no further use, whatever, of the moral law. Now, I read uh, to you that we were delivered from the curse of the law, and I, I think that I believe that as much uh, as, uh, uh, as anyone that believes in the doctrine of grace, and I rejoice in it. But uh, before I have done speaking this evening, I think that you're absolutely going to see and understand that we cannot set aside the moral law or uh, the Ten Commandments uh, as a rule of action uh, in our lives because when we break those we sin and when we break those we fail to do good notice our text again uh, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven now if good works are not being honest being truthful and living according to the commandments of God I would know how to describe uh, good works and loving one another and caring for one another if those are not good works uh, I would not know how to express those but notice what follows think not that I am come to destroy the law now they had uh, they had uh, they had falsely charged our Savior with many things uh, and uh, he knew their thoughts he knew what they were thinking uh, that he had come to destroy uh, the law and the prophets Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. That was not his purpose. And uh, if the law had not been good, then he would have abrogated the law. He would have put it away if it had not been good. Now, uh, I, I, want, I want you to understand that the ceremonial law has been abrogated. It, it has been put away. We, we don't... We no longer, uh, we no longer have to, uh, we don't offer lambs, uh, and we don't offer goats, and we don't offer turtle doves uh, as an offering for sin, and we do, we do not, uh, uh, that is, that is passed away. We do not observe days and weeks and months and, uh, and holy days as they did under the law. That has been put away, uh, and uh, we know uh, that uh, uh, Jesus, when he was here on the earth, that they, uh, they found fault with him because his uh, followers, his disciples, his apostles plucked ears of corn on the Sabbath day and because uh, he uh, healed the sick uh, and made individuals whole on the, ha on the Sabbath day, they charged him with evil. But he, uh, uh, he, uh, he spoke to them and asked them, if they wouldn't relieve one of their beasts that had fallen in a pit on the Sabbath day, and if they would do that, why was it unreasonable to them uh, that uh, the blind should see on the Sabbath day and uh, that uh, those that had infirmity uh, should be relieved on the Sabbath day? And he, uh, he, uh, he taught them uh, to do good uh, and uh, to do well upon the Sabbath day. And uh, the reason uh, that we do not observe the Sabbath day uh, as uh, they did under the law is because that Jesus Christ is our Sabbath 
and that he fulfilled the law and we can rest in his work and we observe uh, the first day of the week as the Lord's day because he, uh, he rose on the Sabbath day and when we meet uh, each first day of the week we declare his resurrection and that uh, we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So he said, think not that I'm come to destroy the law of the prophets. I'm not come to destroy but to fulfill. Now, I want you to reason with me just a little bit here. We read that if we offend in one point of the law, we're guilty of all. Just think of the consequences if our Lord and Master had failed, Brother Don, in one point of the law. That would have doomed we would have been lost, run, world without end, but he fulfilled it. He honored it. Uh, and we know uh, that our righteousness cannot come that way because we cannot fulfill it perfectly. We're weak in the flesh. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we are to set it aside, that it has, uh, that it has no uh, value when the scripture uh, says that uh, it is that the law is spiritual and uh, that uh, Paul recognized by divine inspiration that it was good. I, I want to look in, I believe it is the closing of the third chapter of Romans. There's a verse there that I want to look at and quote for your benefit. <clears throat> The objectors to our recognizing the moral law as valid maintain that we're justified by faith only and that the law, the moral law, has no further benefit to us. But notice, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. Why? Uh, where is your faith? Isn't it in the righteousness of the Son of God? Yes, it's in the righteousness of the Son of God. What did the Son of the living God do? He fulfilled the law to a jot and a tittle. He, in every particular, uh, he honored it and he maintained it and he upheld it to, because uh, it was obligatory on our part to, uh, to uh, honor it. So uh, we, uh, in honoring it... To, uh, in by faith uh, we and seeing fulfillment in the in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, we establish the law uh, because a divine justice and the holiness of God demanded it for verily I say unto you till heaven and earth pass one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled I mentioned uh, the word antinomanian uh, and told you its meaning in, in religious study that it means that a believer has no further use for the moral law uh, as he believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we had not been charged of believing that, I would not have brought it to your attention. But as we have been charged of believing that, I felt it necessary uh, that uh, I set the matter straight to, uh, as to what we believe and what the scriptures uh, teach uh, concerning it. And as Paul affirmed that some say uh, that uh, we say that let us do evil that good may come. But what does he say following that? God forbid. And that isn't the truth of it. That isn't the way that it ought to be. Uh, and, uh, and those of that charge that we are hyper-Calvinist, that we are, are super-Lapsarian, uh, that we believe uh, even that it was God's will and it was God's decree and design that evil should come into the world. Uh, we do not believe that God predestinated uh, evil. Uh, yes, we affirm 
uh, that there's nothing hid from God, uh, that he uh, saw the end from the beginning. He saw the fall, but his seeing the fall uh, does not certainly does not make him the author of sin or that he decreed sin, but in foreseeing it, uh, he provided the remedy. And because that we believe and affirm that the scriptures teach a special atonement, uh, that Jesus died for a specific uh, number and a number given him of the Father, we are accused of being hyper-Calvinist and supralapsarian uh, in, uh, in those uh, beliefs. Uh, but uh, that is the truth uh, of God's Word, and we certainly do not affirm uh, that God is the cause uh, of evil, but he uh, rather uh, will punish evil and overcome evil and overthrow evil, and that he would have us uh, to uh, live uh, according to his commandments. But never, I, it, it, is so, it is so difficult for me to understand how that some ministers have confused the family of God when it is so clearly laid out uh, in God's Word. I, I was, uh, you know, in, in thinking about uh, our not setting aside the commandments, but attempting as best we are able to honor uh, those things. Uh, I, I hear some saying that if we fail uh, to honor them, if we fail to do these things, the only way that we can get to heaven is to keep all of these commandments. And, and it's so hard for me to understand that how some, someone could be so confused when we have been delivered from the curse of the law. But just because he has fulfilled it uh, does not mean that it no longer has value uh, to us. Uh, in examining our, uh, our thoughts and our actions, and he said, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle, shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Everything that was required, uh, everything that justice asked for, everything that was needed was found uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he fulfilled it. Now, he said, Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whosoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Can we set aside uh, the moral law? We cannot uh, set that aside. Uh, we cannot uh, pronounce it invalid. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. Now Jesus would give us a hint of what he's talking about here uh, in the things that he said respecting the scribes and Pharisees, he said, they say and do not. They place grievous burdens on you uh, that cannot be borne, and they do not touch them with their little finger. They do not do them themselves, yet they require them of you. And I'm sure that uh, he spoke uh, of little uh, commandments and great commandments because they had divided uh, the law uh, in, uh, to, uh, into great sins and lesser sins and therefore uh, he speaks uh, of them. But again, may I remind you what, if there are such, if there is such a degree and there must be uh, degrees uh, of greater and lesser sins uh, it, he did not make a breach. Uh, if uh, we might compare it to a letter uh, that was perfectly written and every T was crossed and every I was dotted uh, and every punctuation was perfect, uh, there was no flaw in it from a grammatical standpoint. Uh, and as we think uh, of what Jesus, uh, uh, every jot and every tittle, there was nothing lacking uh, all was fulfilled. I, uh, I, I, I have read this, uh, this example uh, that when we think of little things, uh, we, we know that great ships have been destroyed because of a little leak in the vessel. 
We know of that uh, fine buildings have been destroyed because of a little spark uh, that uh, was not quenched until uh, it burst into flame. Uh, and uh, we know uh, that uh, a way uh, to get out of step is to get a little out of the way uh, and the first thing you know uh, you're a long way uh, out of the way uh, so uh, we understand uh, what uh, do, how subtle Satan is uh, that uh, we would be led astray or uh, that he would affirm to us uh, that's such a little thing that doesn't uh, make a lot of difference anyway uh, but we read uh, in, uh, in the songs, I believe it is, that uh, the little foxes spoil the tender grapes. Uh, so uh, all are important and only God uh, would be able uh, to perfectly uh, pronounce the degrees uh, that there are in sin. But uh, remember what I said and remember what James said, if we offend in one point, we're guilty uh, of all. Uh, so uh, as we think about the use of the moral law and as we think about divine grace, now uh, I, uh, I, I want to, I think that I've made it clear, but I will affirm it to you again uh, that uh, our salvation, our home in heaven is not founded upon our works because the scripture plainly says that it's not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, it is not of works, for by grace are you saved through faith and not, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. I want to affirm that to you. But in the verse that I read in your hearing, in the 16th verse, when he said, Let your light so shine uh, that others may see your good works. Why, uh, this is the shining of grace uh, out of our souls as we are trying to honor God that has done so much for us and lived for us and died for us. We're attempting to honor him and doing the things that we believe and are taught that he would have us to do to live the way uh, that uh, he would have us to do. Uh, one other, there is another principle or two that I would like to mention here to show you the glory of the New Testament and the glory of divine grace above that of the law, uh, where uh, we, uh, Jesus showed, uh, the, uh, showed the spiritual side of this. Uh, Brother Don, he showed uh, that we might, he might denom denominate us a murderer uh, even though we had not committed murder because he said, he that hateth his brother is a murderer. Uh, and he said uh, of, uh, of adultery uh, that uh, the one that, that looks after a woman to lust after her has committed adultery already in his heart, uh, showing that there is a spiritual side of this. And uh, when, if you will remember when Jesus Christ, the, our Lord and Master, uh, when he showed those things uh, that defiled uh, mankind, what defiles us of the head of the list was evil thoughts uh, and, uh, and how uh, it is, this is the heart, center of the heart, what proceeds from the heart uh, and evil thoughts uh, heads the list and then he catalogs uh, those things and uh, those works of the flesh and he names them and pronounces them uh, that they are sin. And, uh, and the moral law condemns these, and the Decalogue of the Ten Commandments co condemns uh, these things. Now, notice this. It, it is in harmony with our lesson in the 21st verse. Ye have heard that it was said of them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say of his brother, Reka, shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell far. And uh, so uh, we, we, we uh, read uh, that he brings this spiritual to us and shows uh, the heart sins uh, that exist in the lives, in our lives, and how desperately wicked and deceitful our hearts are uh, as in our old nature. 
and he is able to cleanse our heart and give us a new heart and to raise us above uh, our sins. I, uh, to show you uh, that, that his mercy extended back to the Old Testament, I, I, I call to your attention in the life of David when Nathan the prophet came to him and he gave him the parable uh, of uh, his conduct. And though he didn't name David, uh, he, named, uh, he named another person. He, uh, he expressed this to David as someone had committed this deed, that uh, he uh, had a rich man that had great flocks, uh, wanted to make a feast, uh, but he didn't take of his flock, but he uh, took of a poor man that only had one lamb that he held uh, close to him and he took that lamb and made a feast and he said David what uh, what should be done with the man that would do all of these things and should be so evil and David said the man that shall do this deed he shall surely die now the law said that brother Tom the law uh, said that he should die and David was right but when David realized uh, that it was him, uh, and I think we should be, uh, we should think like David uh, if uh, the accusing finger came to us uh, and uh, we should die, we should certainly seek mercy. Well, the prophet knew a little bit about God's mercy, I believe, and God's glorious gospel and that Jesus was made a curse for us and we're delivered from the curse of the law and he said, you shall not die, for the Lord has put away your sin. That's my hope. That's what I believe concerning you and me and every hour of grace. We'll not die eternally. We'll not be eternally separated from God, but we are delivered from the curse of the law by the blood of the Lamb and uh, because he was made a curse for us. Now... Uh, they tried to trick him. Do you recall in the 8th chapter of John, uh, they brought a woman uh, to him, and they said, uh, to, they said to him, Moses said that uh, this woman should die. He, she was taken in the very act of adultery, uh, and, uh, uh, and Moses' law said he, she should die. What do you say? And you know, uh, they were attempting to trick him uh, and they wanted to find fault in his speech. They wanted to fault him, uh, but uh, to show that he came not to destroy him, he came to fulfill uh, and he, was, uh, he would vindicate the law. Certainly he wouldn't set aside the law, uh, but uh, he was so much above them. Uh, he, they could not catch him in their craftiness. But he said uh, to them as he thought and as he wrote on the ground uh, and as it were, he were playing in the sand, so to speak. Uh, he said very carefully and direct, let the one that is without sin, let him first cast the first stone. And you know, this stopped their mouths and uh, they uh, went away from the eldest to the youngest. They turned uh, from him, and there was no one left there but he and the woman. And he said, Woman, has no man condemned thee? And she said, Neither do I condemn thee. And, uh, and individuals have said that this, Scripture, this lesson doesn't belong in the legal canon of Scripture. They have denied its uh, authority, uh, its authenticity, uh, uh, but if you understand uh, the mercy and the grace and the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, when he said, neither do I condemn thee, uh, he was not justifying her sin because what follows shows 
without uh, uh, very conclusively that he was not justifying her sin because he said, go and sin no more. Uh, he directed her. He lifted her faith. He lifted her life. Uh, uh, and he showed uh, that he died for this ugly sin as well as other sins and that he paid the penalty uh, for it. Uh, and that he would not condemn eternally uh, or uh, where there was repentance uh, in time uh, that uh, there might be restoration uh, and he could give uh, this woman hope and a new lease on, high, on life. Here she was facing death. Uh, here she was facing stoning, uh, the most horrible death. Uh, and uh, Jesus was able to say, uh, Go. Uh, and sin uh, no more. Now, uh, another, another thought respecting our subject matter. Uh, it has been taught by those uh, that, uh, that believe this antinomanian way uh, that uh, the child of God uh, is not chastised uh, for uh, his sins and uh, that it makes no difference uh, how that he lives uh, in the world uh, and that uh, that is indeed uh, false uh, and contrary to the written word and the glorious gospel of the son of god because uh, he said uh, he declares that whom he loves uh, he corrects he chastens every son and if you be without chastisement, uh, then uh, your bastards are, uh, you uh, have not uh, the evidence uh, that he's your spiritual father if you're without chastisement, if you have no correction. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens, he uh, chastises us, he teaches us. Uh, and uh, yes, he, he chastised David sorely. David suffered uh, for his sins. He never would have been able to pay for it. Uh, he couldn't have paid the price to have redeemed himself from death. Only the Lord could do that. But we suffer that we may learn better. And uh, this mercy is extended to us. Uh, and we fall and we can get up again. Uh, we have that precious uh, verse, though a righteous man uh, falls seven times, he'll not be utterly cast down. Isn't that a, a wonderful doctrine of grace and how we fail? Uh, I, I want, uh, I'm keeping you perhaps too long this evening, uh, but I want to call to your attention to affirm further uh, how important it is how we live it's sustained in the four gospels the importance of the believer maintaining good works and honoring uh the uh the moral law or that law that was given and i call to your attention in romans 13 i believe it is the 13th chapter We'll begin reading with the 8th verse. Owe no man anything but love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, who did he say this to? Who did he write it to? He wrote it to none other than the church at Rome. This is what he wrote. Uh, this is what he required. He told them how that they were saved, uh, that they were called, uh, that they were elected, and uh, that uh, they were justified and that they should be glorified. All of this was fulfilled uh, in uh, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, but as they were and as they had been taught how to live in the glorious gospel, he pointed out those sins to them. In the sixth chapter of 1 Corinthians, we find very clearly that we are bought with a price. Our bodies and our spirits belong to God and he teaches them very clearly a lesson on morality uh, and a, a pattern of conduct 
so far uh, as the activities of men and women uh, in the church of the living God. In, uh, also in his letter to the church at Ephesus. And uh, I, want to, I want us to look at the fourth chapter in his letter to the church at Ephesus. Now, this is the chapter where he speaks uh, of the gift of the apostles and of prophets and of evangelists and pastors and teachers and tells you what they're for, for the perfecting of the saints and their function and the benefit of having these. And then he tells us about the activities of the Gentiles in the 18th verse. That is their way and manner of life, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in, it, in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught of him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which is after God, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, put away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another, be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing that which is good that we may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying that may minister grace to the hearers and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. And let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking but put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Doesn't it sound like it matters how we live and how we think and how we treat one another? And we cannot set aside uh, these things uh, just because of that we're going to heaven anyway. Uh, but when these things are important to us, it further evidences a gracious state in our lives. And our lives are different from uh, the way of the world. Oh, I think to think otherwise, this is very close, I believe, to what the Nicolaitans believed in the Revelation uh, that God said that he hated and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So it does matter, indeed, it matters a lot how we live and how we conduct ourselves and how we honor God. We are to honor him in our bodies and our spirits, which are his. It is, it is, surely, uh, it is surely true that the ceremonial law has passed away it is true that our Lord and Master fulfilled the law to a jot and a tittle, and there was nothing lacking. It was perfect. None of us have been able to do it, but we may not set it aside and say that it is not a rule of action or it is unprofitable to us. We can, if we said it was our ticket to heaven, it would be a heresy. It would be a denial of Jesus Christ to, because he's the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. And we would be frustrating the grace of God. And Paul says, I do not frustrate the grace of God for if righteousness be by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And what that means is this, that you're standing with God. Uh, let's, let's in, as best we can, we're all standing before the judgment seat and uh, we're before God we're before the holiest of holies and we give testimony of why we're there and we should we say uh, that uh, we're here because of how well we kept your law 
we could never stand there. We could never be there. But we're there because your son represented us. Your son died for us. And he lived for us. And he prayed for us. And he bought us with his own blood. To, and our, our own righteousness could not stand in your courts. You could not bear to behold us because we are sinned and we have transgressed your law but because of your love and because of your everlasting love because of your mercy and your grace and because of the gift of your son and to say with paul thanks be to god for his unspeakable gift the gift of his son in him is everything that we need and we have such an obligation to him we owe him so much and how he lived and died in this world how wonderfully he lived how wonderfully he died he only has perfect compassion and understanding he only has perfect love one day we'll be like him we can stand in that court as joint heirs with him because we will be changed these vile bodies these corruptible bodies will be changed that's a wonderful thought isn't it hope that i have distinguished correctly and for your and to your understanding some of these things this evening god bless you and we'll stand if you're here in this hour tonight with the church, you come. Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Paradise Primitive Baptist Church is located at 5300 Mansfield Road in Arlington, Texas. Services begin at 1030 each Sunday morning. Plan to come and worship with us. To find out more about Paradise Primitive Baptist Church, visit www.paradisepbc.org. Be sure to visit our website for articles, video, and audio sermons, as well as biblical answers to your questions. Thanks for watching, and be sure to join us again next week. May God richly bless you.